Okay, good. So um, we were discussing yesterday the action of pure supergravity in four dimensions, minimal supersymmetry. And we said that the action uh, is essentially the sum of the Einstein-Hilbert action and the Rarita-Schwinger action. And essentially, we have uh, the standard Einstein-Hilbert here. And then we have the kinetic term for the gravitino, where I remind you that the derivative has become a covariant derivative because we have gravity in there. And here as well, this is an R that depends at this stage on omega and the field bands because, of course, you have contracted in order to get the Ricci scalar starting from the two form. And we said that this action should be invariant under supersymmetry with a supersymmetry transformation for the gravitino, which is simply uh, the covariantization, essentially, of the gravitation under supersymmetry that you would expect. And for what concerns the field bind, uh, we have seen that uh, instead we have a uh, transformation where we have the field bind that goes into the pitino as expected. And we discussed the fact that these derive can be guessed from the algebra, but we also saw that we actually can derive the transformation starting from a super died, no. <laughs> uh, the transformation sometimes it works ah. in the, <laughs> the right position. Okay. Uh. Maybe I, I exit the room and then I come back. <laughs> okay. Well, it seems to work now, so you see. <laughs> okay, so uh, we can guess it from the algebra. We can actually derive it by taking the, the transformation rule on the Rarita Schwinger action and checking the fact that out of the variation of the Rarita Schwinger action, when you vary the gravitinos, there is one particular combination that we checked yesterday that is proportional to the Einstein equations. Uh, and therefore, since you know that you get the Einstein equation from the variation of the field band in here, uh, then you can uh, uh, find the appropriate answers for the field band in order to match the two terms. Uh, once you did that, though, you didn't improve uh, supersymmetry invariance yet, because, of course, you still have to vary uh, the uh, other field binds appearing, for instance, in the Rarita Schwinger action. You have to vary the um, spin connection appearing in both terms. And then you have to decide whether you want to use the first or second order formalism. And uh, if you remember, in the finding an equation from the Rarita Schwinger action, we have to do an integration by parts. So we also have that term as well. Now, the interesting thing is that if you put everything together, I will skip all the calculations and just write down the result. If you put everything together, you get the following expression. Where I'm writing everything in, uh, uh, yeah, well, this is really, of course, you will have the integral here. And I'm writing everything in differential form language. So you have to understand uh, that here the various terms are going to be differential forms. So 
So clearly the field bane is a differential form, as we know already. But here I'm writing also the gravitino as a differential form, uh, and as well as the spin connection. Okay. And uh, why this expression is particularly interesting? You see right away here that once you put together all the terms, essentially you're already done. Because if you are in the first order formalism, you still have to decide what is the transformation rule of the spin connection. I fix the transformation rule of the gravitino, I fix the one of the field bind, I have to fix the spin connection yet. So deciding, asking that this variation be zero, of course, because I want the action to I can just choose an appropriate variation of the spin connection that cancels this term. They are in a bracket here, so that everything vanishes. If I am in, first or in second order formalism, on the other hand, I know that I have to impose that the torsion is vanishing. But imposing the torsion to vanish means exactly imposing that this term is zero. So you see, in second order formalism, this is actually direct zero. I don't have to do anything. Okay? And you also see that, as I was claiming, the variation of spin connection gives you the torsion equation. You see, if I look at the equation of motion for the spin connection, no, if I look at the variation, I get something which is proportional to the torsion, up to some field binds, okay, which I can always invert. So, essentially, this tells you, that, and and of course now you can ask, what happens about the uh, spin connection, the transformation rule of the spin connection that I obtain in the first and second order formalism, because they will not be the same. The, either in formalism, I read from here the transformation rule of function in first, uh, sorry, in first order. In second order formalism, I uh, know that the variation of the spin connection is given by the variation of the spin connection with respect to the field bind times the variation of the field bind, which is fixed. The two variations are not the same, but of course, they become the same once you use the torsion condition. So on shell, again, they become the same, as they should be if you want to have the same theory, of course. So eventually, uh, you get the same thing. But as I mentioned yesterday, the interesting thing is that if you write everything in first order, that's everything you have to write. And also in second order, essentially, it's the same thing. I don't have to write down anything else. Only the difference is that in second order, I know that the spin connection is not just a function of the field binds, but it's a function of the gravitinos as well. So there I have various Fermi interactions. Okay? So this closes essentially the discussion of the, uh, of the uh, pure supergravity without a cosmological constant, because now what I want to do is to add a cosmological constant. Okay? So I don't want to add matter yet, but I want to see if I'm able to write supergravity uh, with a cosmological constant. It's, it's the same thing if you consider standard Einstein gravity, you will have your Einstein Hilbert action. And then you can add here a constant. Nothing prevents you from adding a constant there, of course, in the classical theory. Uh, and even if you don't have any matter. And of course, you know that once you look at this theory, uh, the equations of motion will not be simply that the Ricci tensor is vanishing now, but the Ricci tensor is going to proportional to the cosmological constant, uh, or better, it is proportional to the metric uh, via the cosmological constant. 
And you know that now you have different solutions depending on whether the cosmological constant is positive, negative, or zero. Now, clearly, if it's zero, uh, you get uh, Ricci flat uh, spaces as solutions. Uh, in the other two cases, you have spaces with, uh, with uh, uh, different curvatures, of course, that depend on the uh, sign of the cosmological constant. Now, if you're interested in maximally symmetric space-times, so I'm not clearly claiming uh, that these are the only solutions, no? Because of course, already without the cosmological constant, you know you can find several different solutions for the Einstein equations in empty space-time. Uh, the, uh, the thing, though, is that if you look at maximally symmetric space-time, so the space-time that have the maximum number of allowed uh, symmetries, then you see that, uh, well, for uh, uh, vanishing cosmological constant, of course, you have Minkowski space-time. With a positive cosmological constant, you have the so-called the Sitter space-time. And with a negative cosmological constant, you have the so-called anti-de-sitter space-time. And these spaces, I'm talking now about the de-sitter and anti-de-sitter because, I mean, Minkowski, we already did essentially supergravity in Minkowski. So I want to try and see whether I can extend gravity on the sitter and anti-de-sitter to supergravity essentially with a positive and negative cosmological constant. Uh, these spaces are, are quite peculiar because, uh, uh, well, Minkowski, you know, has uh, a maximally symmetric group, which is the Poincaré group of symmetries. Uh, the sitter and anti-de sitter have also um, a, maximally, uh, a maximal group of symmetries, which, however, which is always essentially a, a symmetric orthogonal group. Uh, but it differs depending on the cosmological constant. So if I am in four dimensions, essentially I end up having uh, uh, the, uh, for the Sitter space-time, I end up having the Lorentz group, but in five dimensions. And if I look instead at anti the Sitter, so negative cosmological constant, I end up having a Lorentz group, but with the signature minus, minus, plus, plus, plus. And, in fact, you can actually see that the sitter for and anti the sitter for are actually homogeneous space-times, meaning that, uh, clearly, we still want Lorentz invariance. Uh, so, at every point, since at every point on your manifold you have this group as the invariance group, the global symmetry of your space-time, you still have to have a local Lorentz invariance that allows you to essentially uh, change frames at each point, which means that the Sitter space-time is a quotient of this type and anti the Sitter space-time is a quotient of that type. And uh, SO1, 4 is like SO5, has uh, 10, uh, and the same is true for SO2, 3, of course, has 10 generators, just like uh, the Poincare group, of course. This is a maximal space time, so it's always 10 generators of symmetries. Uh, the Lorentz group has uh, six, and so you're left with four dimensional quotients, okay? So, as it should, because these are four-dimensional space-times. In fact, a nice way to, uh, to write, to describe these spaces, is to think of a five-dimensional space-time with uh, uh, one coordinate more, of course, so I have my Lorentzian signature, the standard Lorentzian signature on four of these 
and this is common for both the sitter and anti sitter on four coordinates. But then I take a fifth coordinate uh, with a different signature, depending on uh, the uh, space that I'm interested in, whether it's the sitter or anti the sitter, and the same space can be described then by a hyperboloid, meaning that uh, I take embedded in this five-dimensional space-time with this signature, which refle is reflected by the signature, essentially, no, of the uh, of the uh, isometries then of the space-time. I have an hyperboloid, which has also uh, which is also given by the sum of the coordinate with the sign again. Sorry. X five square equals minus plus L square. So L here is the radius. And yeah, let me make use the same sign on both places so that things are the same. So when I use a minus above, I use a minus also downstairs, and uh, of course the upper sign is the anti de sitter and the lower sign is the de sitter uh, space-time. Describes one describes the anti de sitter, the other describes the de sitter, and of course you can solve essentially. You no, know, you solve this constraint in terms of four coordinates. You plug it in here, and you get the various metrics you have for the sitter and anti sitter, depending on whether you cover the whole hyperboloid, you have global coordinates. If you don't cover the whole hyperboloid, you might have several different interesting coordinates, like the cosmological coordinates for the sitter or for anti sitter or other coordinates that, like uh, uh, those that are used in the ADS-CFT correspondence, which have a flat uh, four-dimensional, essentially, space, uh, three-dimensional in this case, sorry. Uh, Minkowski space-time embedded in the metric, and, uh, and anyway, this is the structure of space-time. The interesting thing here uh, that I want to use, and my advantage now, if I want to understand how and if I can supersymmetrize this, is the fact that both these spaces an algebra which is essentially a Lorentz algebra, as I said before. So I can use indices, capital indices A and B, which are uh, indices now running over 0, 1, 2, 3, and 5, which give me the which allows me to describe the algebra of the isometries in the following way. To correct coefficients here. Okay, so this is the standard uh, Lorentz algebra in five dimensions with a signature. Now, that depends on how you choose eta. And eta is chosen as a diagonal matrix, of course, uh, with signs minus, plus, plus, plus. And then the last one is either minus for ADS or it's plus for the sitter. OK, again, this is ADS and this is the sitter. But the structure of the algebra is clearly the same. Just a sign that flips that is important, though. And uh, when you want to identify the generators of uh, Lorentz rotations uh, in your space-time, of your effective four-dimensional Lorentz rotation and the translations, then clearly you call essentially mu, this index, no, 0, 1, 2, th sorry, well, this is not the index, the index is A. I'll split the index A in mu and 5. And uh, what you, or A, sorry, these are flat indices, so let's keep the small A, B, C, D for the flat and mu, nu, rho for the curved ones. 
So uh, the small a, so this means that uh, if I split my generators, I will have MAB are the Lorentz generators. And then I will have MA5 or M5A. This is anti-symmetric. And this is going to be identified with the translations in this way. So I introduce explicitly the uh, radius. You see, this is the radius essentially of my hyperboloid. No? If, I if you look at this expression, this tells you that, uh, for instance, let's do ADS. Uh, then you see that uh, uh, when you switch off these xi's, for instance, this means that x0 squared plus x5 squared has to be, it's a circle of radius L. No? So you have an object which is something like this where here you have the coordinates x0 and x5, and then you have the other coordinates here, okay? This is, for instance, a DS. And by the way, one thing which is, uh, which I didn't stress is the fact that you see, since in ADS you have two time-like directions, and these are precisely x0 and x5, this means that in ADS you have closed time-like curves, and therefore, usually when you do physics, what you assume there is that you're talking about the covering space, ADS, not really ADS, okay? Anyway, what I'm interested in, oh, I'm not going to discuss much more than an anti uh, per se, but what I'm interested in is trying to see whether I can uh, do supergravity with a cosmological constant. So I want to understand, first of all, the structure of the algebra that I get uh, for these two spaces, because there is something peculiar that happens when I uh, uh, try to supersymmetrize this algebra. So just like in Poincaré, I have the super Poincaré algebra, I would like to build now the super de Sitter and super anti de Sitter algebra, okay? in order then to, uh, to write down the uh, uh, the transformation rules uh, and hence uh, recover uh, the uh, an invariant supersymmetric invariant action. Now, if I uh, take this uh, this uh, identification from that algebra, what I see is that of course I get the Lorentz algebra here, so the standard Lorentz algebra. So this is nothing to. be surprised of. I get that, of course, translations rotate under Lorentz transformations. They are a vector, so obviously they rotate. But then, and here comes the crucial point of the whole discussion. You see, if translations now are, if the momenta the PA are related to the generators M5, M5A commutator with M5B does not give zero now because there is an eta phi five which is non-trivial. So M5A with M5B gives something here which poses on the Lorentz rotation. So in the sitter and anti de sitter, of course, translations do not commute, the space is curved. No surprise there, but still. And uh, the crucial thing here is that in these conventions, since I have minus, uh, well, if you check, I mean, you plug it, plug in there. Okay, let's do it. So if you plug here 5A, 5B, then the only term which survives is the one where A and C are 5, 5 here, and then you have uh, A, B, and then you see I have a minus in front. So this means that the plus sign here is for anti de sitter now, and this is for the sitter. Okay? Now I'm, I'm trying to be careful because the sign, the whole discussion 
to be a matter of I don't make mistakes. Uh, but in any case, if you follow the reasoning, then you understand. And, and for sure, you realize that only one to work, as I will show you. So I spoiled the surprise, but I guess it's not really a big surprise that only anti deceptor is going to work, only negative cosmological constant can be supersymmetrized. So why is this important now? This is important because, you see, when you want to supersymmetrize this and make a supersymmetric algebra, of course, you have to introduce also uh, the supercharges, the anti-commutators of the supercharges and the commutators of the supercharges with these generators. So let's assume that you don't do anything and you just take the same commutators you had in uh, uh, Minkowski, only you change the commutator with the Jacobi. You have a problem with the Jacobi because uh, for instance, if you take two translations, now let me be very schematic here, and a supercharge, the Jacobi is going to be, uh, is going to give you commutators of this sort. No, you will have an, another commutator of the form uh, QPP, no? Something like that. Uh, all, all this should be zero. Okay, you have the three commutators, I mean, put the appropriate indices now, it's not important. I just want to uh, stress one fact that you can see right away without being too precise here. And the fact is the following. Uh, in Minkowski, in the Poincaré algebra, this is zero. So clearly PQ, we assume, was zero. Zero plus zero plus zero is zero. No problem. But now, this is not zero in the sitter or anti sitter, this is proportional to the Lorentz generator. And the Lorentz generator, of course, does not commute with the supercharges because the supercharges are a spinor, so they transform in the spinorial representation. So this commutator is going to be proportional to Q. And therefore, in order for this to be zero, this means that this commutator should not be zero. This commutator now should be proportional to Q in such a way that you get something proportional to Q. In the commutator, you get, again, something proportional to Q, the same there. And then you have a chance to make the whole Jacobi work. OK? So this is the crucial point. In order to, uh, in order to make the Jacobi work, you have to assume that the commutator of the translations the momenta and the supercharges should not be vanishing. Now, the thing is that can work. Now, Q, let's take Q as a Majorana spinner, as I was mentioning. And then there are two ways here you can make it work in principle. You can put a gamma matrix and Q again. But you can also make it work, well, with a certain constraint here, of course. Let me call it, uh, well, let me call it alpha. Or you can take another coefficient here and put gamma 5, gamma A on Q. And the interesting thing is that in order to respect the uh, Majorana property, this has to be real while this has to be imaginary. Okay, so if I write them both real, then for alpha and beta real coefficients, then here you have an i. Okay, and that has to do with the fact that gamma 5 under charge conjugation changes sign. Okay. Uh, well, if you remember essentially, gamma a, if I do the charge conjugation of gamma A and I leave it invariant, since you know that gamma 5 is the product, no, is I, gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, then gamma 5 will not, will now change sign, okay? So that's the reason, essentially, algebraically. But the important thing is that you have these two choices. And now, uh, I, I stress this because if you look also at reviews of supergravity, there are mistakes on this. They say, okay, there are some, some, some reviews in the literature that tell you, well, you either choose this or you choose that. Okay? Actually, you don't have to do that. That would be 
surprising somehow if you then look at the matter couplings because there are there. And you see, there is one way you can uh, <laughs> interpolate, if you wish, between the two, which is uh, take a combination of the two. No? If I write things using a chiral notation, no? I'm going to write left and right, essentially what do I have? I have that the gamma 5 on the left and on the right will give the spinner or minus that spinner. So if I, if I take the two things, I will get alpha plus i beta on the left, for instance, and alpha minus i beta on the right. So essentially what I can do here is just take a complex coefficient and introduce the chiralities, and then this is consistent with Majorana conventions for G an arbitrary complex number and reduces to one of the two previous conventions when you choose G to be real or purely imaginary. Okay? But the most general thing you and you will see so later there is a good reason for that. Um, so actually let me so I want to be consistent also then with the calculation that we'll do later. This is a matter of, uh, clearly here I can define this, co this coefficient as I want, okay? Now let me define this with a minus and a factor of 2. And actually to have g, I use here right and left, okay? It's a matter of convention. The minus one half is there for purely conventional uh, reasons, which have to do with the fact that I want to simplify some calculations later on. Okay, clearly, refine g as I want is a complex number. The important thing is that the commutator should not be vanishing. Okay, that's the the, the important message. The commutator cannot be vanishing, otherwise the Jacobi would not be there. So you see, I have a new parameter now. G, which, as you will see, not be independent, of course, from this parameter that I have here. It should not be independent, no, because the difference that I have between Poincaré and the sitter and anti the sitter is the fact that I have now a scale, which introduces a non vanishing commutator in the translations, and then this must be related, since this is related to the non vanishing of this commutator, then G should be related to that, to L. Okay, and in fact, you can now do the following. Uh, yeah, let's do it here. You can now do explicitly the Jacobi identity that I mentioned before. So I want to find zero when I take the commutator of two momenta and the ja Jacobi, sorry, between two momenta and uh, supercharge, a left supercharge, then the Jacobi identity has this form. Okay, and should be vanishing. And now let's use what we did there. So here I have that uh, this commutator PQ is going to be, so this is left, so I have to take the conjugate of that. So this is going to be some G conjugate, a minus one half, a gamma B on Q right. So I get the commutator of that. This is uh, plus or minus 1 over L square MAB. And this is going to be now, again, minus G star over 2, gamma A on Q right. Okay? Then I have to do, so I, I pull out the minus G star over 2 and the gamma B. And then I have the commutator of PA with Q right. Here I have plus or minus 1 over L square. And then I have the commutator of Q left 
with MAB, which I didn't give there, but I will give it now. And then here I have a plus G star over 2, gamma A, and the commutator of PB with QR. Now you see, this again gives me another gamma, and it gives me a G, now the conjugate, because now I have the commutator of P with Q right, so I get G. So now I get uh, minus times minus is plus, so I get G absolute value square over 4. So you see, there is no way now, no, doesn't matter how I choose uh, the sign there, or how I orient, or the phase of G, it's going to disappear in this commutator. Then from here I get gamma B, gamma A on QR. From here I get, uh, I get the opposite sign. So I get a minus gamma A, gamma B on Q left now. Because the P with Q right goes into gamma Q left. And this has to be plus or minus 1 over L square and this commutator. And now I didn't give this commutator actually, but this commutator, as you know, goes with gamma AB, which is the generator of uh, the Lorentz transformations. And the interesting thing is that uh, if you yeah, put the right coefficient and sine, this is what you get from this commutator. Which means that if you want this to be vanishing, you see you don't have much of a choice. Because the first term is absolute value of g squared divided by 2 gamma minus gamma AB on Q left. And then you have plus or minus 1 over 2 L squared gamma AB Q left. So this is 0 only for the upper sign. So for ADS, you find that G squared is 1 over L squared. And this is the reason why I chose that the funny factor 1 half there. And for the sitter, there is no solution. Or rather, I shouldn't say the sitter and anti sitter. Well, yeah, it's the anti sitter superalgebra. Yeah, but yeah, OK, it's, it's anti sitter superalgebra, yeah. It's anti sitter superalgebra, or if you wish, negative cosmological constant and positive cosmological constant, OK? So what is this teaching us? This is teaching us that um, tries a negative value of the cosmological constant, you cannot supersymmetrize a positive value of the cosmological constant. Now here we need the uh, derivation for the minimal supersymmetric case. You can ask yourself, well, maybe things will change if I change the number of supersymmetries. And in fact, there are subtleties there. Uh, one of the first proof was a very pap old paper by Ferrara, where actually he took the superconformal algebra in one dimension higher, and then he tried to see whether he could uh, find the Sitter and anti Sitter algebras. And you can actually uh, cook up some some peculiar cases with, for an e with an even number of supersymmetries in which you can build a, some sort of supersymmetric uh, algebra for the sitter, but then when you realize then on the fields, you start having wrong signs on the kinetic terms of the fields. So eventually, the, the, the point is that you can supersymmetrize a negative cosmological constant. You cannot supersymmetrize the positive cosmological constant. So this means that, uh, well, it's like if you wish in global supersymmetry, no, if you look in global supersymmetry, you know that in global supersymmetry, a supersymmetric vacuum has zero vacuum energy, and any positive vacuum energy means that you break supersymmetry. Now, here, things will be a bit different, but you, what you're sure is that a positive vacuum energy is going to break supersymmetry. Okay? 
you can have negative cosmological constant, you can have zero cosmological constant with supersymmetry. We will learn that you can have also negative and zero cosmological constant breaking supersymmetry. So there is not a U1 to one relation like in global supersymmetry, okay? But we'll discuss this later on. But for sure, when you have a positive cosmological constant, there is no way you can build a supersymmetric uh, theory, local theory of uh, supersymmetry, I mean, uh, supergravity theory, okay? Now, if you go on the archive, you find papers with the title The Sitter Supergravity, and then you can ask yourself what that is about. And uh, the fact is that uh, I think that's a misnomer. It's really a, a something that is confusing a lot of people, and for a good reason. I really think it's not the call it the Sitter Supergravity, as it is in the title, but the thing is that, uh, obviously, whenever you have a broken symmetry, you know, think about also the Higgs uh, symmetry, the Higgs theory, when you are, or any other mechanism, when you break a symmetry, and you're in a vacuum where the symmetry is broken, you don't have any more a linear realization of that symmetry on the vacuum, because the vacuum breaks that symmetry, but you may still have a non-linear realization. Okay. So what, what these people call the Sitter supergravity is not really a supersymmetric theory in the sense that we are discussing here. Symmetry is not realized linearly, it's realized non-linearly. Okay? This, of course, you can do on, a, on, a, on any vacuum with any cosmological constant. Uh, just like I can take any action without uh, any symmetry and make it uh, symmetric with respect to certain uh, symmetry in a non-linear uh, uh, way. Okay, so the fact is that if I have a symmetry which is broken on the vacuum, I can still find some nonlinear realization of that symmetry. Okay, but if I think about linear supersymmetry, so having supermultiplets with the same numbers of bosonic and fermionic states, then no way you can build a supersymmetric action with a positive cosmological constant. That's the main message of this part. Any questions so far? Yes. It means negative? Negative cosmological constant? Negative cosmological constant means that we have a, a negative volume energy. Yes. Uh, and usually, at least in global supersymmetry, for sure, positive vacuum energy means that we are breaking supersymmetry spontaneously, but negative vacuum energy is forbidden. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, first of all, this is not the field theory. This is gravity. And you know, in gravity, there is no minimum principle. That's one of the problems of uh, gravity. Um, you, you have problems with conserving energies. You have, uh, no, I mean, uh, and that's exactly one of the points. So you can have negative vacuum energy without problems in gravity. You can have it in supergravity, of course. The breaking of supersymmetry is more subtle than, as I said, I'll discuss it later on. But the idea is that, uh, the general message is that in supersymmetry, there is a one-to-one -one relation between the vacuum energy and the fact that you preserve or you don't preserve supersymmetry. So zero vacuum energy, supersymmetry is preserved, Supersymmetry is preserved, the vacuum energy must be zero. You have a positive cosmological of the vacuum energy, supersymmetry is broken, vice versa, you want to break supersymmetry, the contribution to the energy is positive, and therefore the vacuum energy is going to be positive. In supergravity, this is not going to be like that. Whenever you will find a positive cosmological constant, you will break supersymmetry, but you can break supersymmetry and have zero or negative value of the cosmological constant. And that's one of the reasons why the vacuum selection should be really studied in supergravity rather than in field theory. Because the cancellations that you might have in supergravity, you don't see in the field theory. Okay? But I'll discuss this later on, okay? Once we have the picture, a better picture also with matter. Okay. okay? Uh, I have another question um, on the last... About non-linear realization, yeah. um, I'm still confused because, I mean, if if the vacuum realizes the symmetry, non-linear the symmetry, but the algebra should still be there. So I don't see 
how is it possible to, I mean, uh, from this analysis, it seems that for, for positive cosmological constant, you cannot even write down algebra. I cannot write down a, a, a algebra, yes. Uh, the, the point is that you're not, when you're writing down, uh, when you're writing down uh, um, this, uh, these nonlinear realizations, you start from a Lagrangian where you are not supersymmetrizing the anti de Sitter algebra or the de Sitter algebra. You are supersymmetrizing the Poincare algebra, you couple it to matter, you couple the theory to matter, you get the Lagrangian and the back embraces. Ah, okay. So uh, we're talking about a different algebra essentially. So the, the, this is the fact that. So what we are doing here is asking ourselves whether you can write a supersymmetric anti de Sitter algebra or a supersymmetric de Sitter algebra. If those exist, then you know you can have a linear realization of that symmetry with a positive or a negative cosmological constant. That's the statement. Okay. okay? Now, when, uh, if you talk of more general situation, in more general situation, when you write down a standard supergravity, you write uh, a Poincaré supergravity, let's say, with all the matter couplings uh, and so on and so forth, and then in the, among these matter couplings you will generate a potential, a scalar potential if you have scalar fields, and then as usual the scalar potential might have vacua, and then this will break, might break supersymmetry, and then that symmetry that you had at the beginning realized linearly on the fields and, and uh, on your theory will become non-linearly realized on that vacuum. Okay? Yes? No, 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 no. There, there is, if there is a relation about this and the Sitter conjecture, no, not directly in the sense that this is a, a statement of principle. You cannot have a supersymmetric uh, uh, the Sitter vacuum. Uh, the, the Sitter conjecture has to do with the fact that you cannot uh, realize a positive cosmological constant within string theory. Now, in supergravity, I can realize a positive cosmological constant is not a problem. As I said, I cannot realize it in a way that it is supersymmetric, but I can realize it. I can write down a theory, a Lagrangian, that has a vacuum with a positive cosmological constant. Okay? So the, 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 the Sitter conjecture is deeper in the sense that it beats something that you can do for gravity. Any other question? Uh, I wanted to ask if it seems like kind of an accident that for the sitter we don't have a solution to the Jacobian identity. So, is there a deep meaning for this non realization of the sitter's gravity, or it's just uh, a deep meaning? <laughs> a, a physical meaning why this is forbidden? Uh, I don't know what could satisfy you as an answer. Uh, the, the What's the, wrong this with is, this the sitter? Well, it's, it's the same thing that is wrong, if you wish, with having a positive cosmological constant, a positive vacuum energy in global supersymmetry. A positive vacuum energy in global supersymmetry breaks supersymmetry. And this is what is telling you here is the same, is that uh, supersymmetry cannot be realized with positive energy on the vacuum. That's the best answer I can give you at the moment. I, would, I don't know. If something comes up to my mind better than this, I will let you know. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, now that we have this, uh, this is a general result. Now I can, though, uh, I can look at this case, of course, and construct supergravity with a negative cosmological constant. So I can write down, and I, I know from this argument that I should be able to take the original Lagrangian, which now I erased, with a negative cosmological constant. So Einstein Hilbert, Rarita Schwinger, plus a negative cosmological constant, and I should be able to supersymmetrize it 
Now the question is, when I do that, do I get additional terms? What terms do I get? How, how, what are the things that I get? And uh, one thing we will see is that I will get a mass like term for the Dino. So I will have supersymmetry realized where I have, of course, that the graviton is a massless particle. I would expect by supersymmetry that the gravitino is a massless particle, but as I will show you, I will generate a mass term for that. And this has to do with precisely, again, with this algebra. And I will come back to this later on, after I will prove this and I will show you how things work out. Uh, but the point is that when you classify states in Minkowski, uh, you use the mass as a good quantum number because you know that uh, p square commutes uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, any other combination, essentially, if you wish, of your generators in the algebra. However, if you do it in a Uh, p square does not commute with uh, uh, with the Lorentz generators, for instance. No, imagine that you do. Let me just do this very briefly, and then I'll go. I'll move on to the construction of the theory. This is a point that is going to be useful for framing what we're going to find later. If you take p square. Uh, let's say, for instance, uh, with MAB, you would expect this to be zero. Now, uh, if you, if you uh, look at the, uh, well, in the standard, uh, uh, in the standard, um, sorry, with MAB, uh, yeah, I would like to do, well, maybe not, that's not exactly what I want to do. Uh, I want to take really, let me see. I want to take uh, the Casimirs of my algebra, probably. So in, uh, in uh, yeah, uh, OK, let's do the following. In a supersymmetric theory, you know that P and Q commute. Let me start from this statement which is easier, okay, in Minkowski. So this also tells you that P square with Q commutes, which means that representations of supersymmetry have fixed mass. Now once you have an eigenvalue for P square on a given state, you have a certain state of mass m. Let's say that you get uh, that uh, your state has mass uh, m. Then, uh, if you take a, uh, the supersymmetric of that, so if you take the action on the state that comes out generated out of acting with the supersymmetry on that, then because of this commutator you still get that this is minus m squared. So you get the same mass for all the states. However, when you do it in anti de Sitter or uh, in, well, yeah, let's stick now to anti de Sitter since we're talking about the supersymmetric algebra. In anti de Sitter, then this is not vanishing, which means that p squared is not vanishing, which means that this is not true anymore. So you have one state that has a certain mass, but then the other states in the multiplet need not have the same mass. Okay? Yeah. That's, that's exactly the problem, and I will come to that later. Okay? Actually, the, the big problem is precisely that in uh, anti de Sitter, it's problematic to define a mass, because p square is not a Casimir, and doesn't commute with the Casimir of the algebra. And so, uh, what do you call mass? Uh, there are different definitions in the literature. And 
past, people would uh, uh, call mass the difference between essentially the Casimir and the value that the Casimir would have on the uh, uh, states that satisfy the threshold of the unitarity bound. So you have certain unitarity bound for states, the, bound, the, 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 the states that are at the threshold of the unitarity bound, you call them massless, and then you call mass the difference. But this is not what people use nowadays, uh, especially because of the EDS-CFT correspondence. People tend to use the mass as the name of the value of the Laplace Beltrami operator on the field. So simply box phi, you call mass what comes out of that calculation, essentially. Even though, of course, in anti de Sitter you have curvature. So the equation for a scalar field is not simply box phi. Now you expect something like box plus the curvature with some coefficient on phi. No? For instance, you would expect to call massless the one that has an equation here, which is not box phi equals zero, but box phi equal to the value of the curvature, for instance. Okay? So it's not obvious what you call mass. Indeed, that's a problem. So you have to decide what you want to call mass, and then sticking to that definition, then you will see that, uh, indeed, for instance, in anti de Sitter, you will be allowed to have negative square masses and still have, for scalar fields, and still have a unitary theory. And the reason is essentially that, I mean, what you call mass is, is up to you in a certain sense, okay? There's no unique, clear-cut definition of what a mass is in anti de Sitter, but we'll come back to that later. So the only thing that I wanted to stress here is the fact that uh, for sure, uh, uh, states in the same multiplet need not have the same mass. Don't be surprised now, don't be alarmed at least, if now we will find that we generate mass terms even in the theory uh, with the massless uh, graviton multiplet. Okay? So let's see how do we build this Lagrangian. And of course, I'm not going to prove again invariance under supersymmetry in full glory, but also because most of the Lagrangian is the same as before. But the reason why I want to do this exercise is because this is a prototype of what happens in any supergravity theory. I think this is really the nice thing about this simple example, that if you take supergravity plus a cosmological constant, of course a negative cosmological constant, then uh, the steps that you need to do in order to make it supersymmetric uh, are modifications of the modifications that you have to introduce in order to make it supersymmetric with respect to the zero cosmological constant case are exactly what happens in any extended supergravity theory when you want to introduce uh, a potential, for instance, or a gauging, or also in uh, n equals one when you introduce gauge interactions. So even though there is no gauge interaction here, even though there are no matter fields at all, the steps the, and the, uh, uh, and the pieces, new pieces that will appear with respect to the standard Lagrangian that we had before are coming out exactly in the same way as in any other supergravity theory. So this is really a prototype of a generic supergravity theory. So the first thing that we have to do, so we have of course our Einstein-Hilbert and we have the rarita schwinger okay, action. I'm not going to write them again. These are the same as before. Now let's assume that supersymmetric uh, with respect to the standard supersymmetry transformations that I wrote before. Okay, so this is my action which is supersymmetric to begin with, but now, but now I want to introduce a cosmological constant. So from here you see that I have, to, I have modified certain structure constants. So let's follow what we did, uh, what we did uh, uh, yesterday in guessing what the supersymmetry transformations are from the algebra. The first point 
is that in order to introduce a cosmological constant, I have to modify at order g, where g now is my coupling, if you wish, that's why I call it g, even though now we know that g eventually is going to be related to L, to the radius of anti sitter. but this is because I want to have a structure that is more general, okay, that will be true. Um, I want to modify at order g the SUSY transformation of the gravitino. That's the first thing I have to do. Why do I have to do that? Because if you look at here, at this commutator, now I see that among, so remember, no, let's say that I have my generators, I have the structure constants, now what I'm saying is that there I have a structure constant where a is a small a, b is a spinner index, let me write r to say that this is a right uh, spinner for instance, and then c is a left spinner, and this is what? This structure constant is minus g over 2 gamma. Okay? This is the structure constant I get that I read from here. Now, this is a new structure constant which I didn't have before. So when I will send the g to zero, I should go back to the uh, Poincaré supergravity that we discussed yesterday. But the fact that now this new structure constant, if you remember now the fact that my connections should transform no, with the derivatives of the parameter plus I will have the structure constants here. Like that. This tells us that when I have here a gravitino, now I have to uh, be careful and introduce chiralities, so even though that's a Majorana spinner, let's take the left chirality, and as you know, I mean, the right chirality is going to be just the charge conjugate of that, then this will have, of course, the, the simple derivative, then I have the piece where these structural constants were giving me the connection, so this is not going to change, so let me just write directly here the covariant derivative. But then, I, you see, I have a new term here. I have a new term that, that comes from these structure constants. This will be something that couples to a spinner now right rather than left. You know, this is going to be left, this is going to be right, so this is the spinner right, and this then is going to be a vector index. So this should couple to the vector a mu a, which in our case is just a field bind. Okay, you remember that, that, that we wrote the various vectors, our a mu a, where the field bind, the spin connection, and the gravitino. So this means that here I will get something that goes like gamma well, let me write it in full. I will have gamma A, E mu A, epsilon right, with in front my G, and the if I do for left, then, then yeah, I have the minus one half. Sorry, again, that is exactly what I get from uh, from those um, relations, structure constant. Oh, here I've been a bit uh, sloppy in the sense that this is what I read directly from the algebra, but then I have to fix the dimensions of the various objects, no? And, and as you know, here I have a Planck mass, of course. No. And for the same reason, now let's take G to be a pure number for simplicity. Okay, so I want G to be a pure number, not to have any scale in there. And if I do that, then I have to put a Planck mass square. OK, 
Okay, so this tells us that this is modified. Well, first of all, I have to do left, left, because the right will be the conjugate of this. Like that. And when I write gamma mu, I understand, of course, that this is the curved gamma matrices rather than the flat ones. OK, so this is the first step. In order to introduce a cosmological constant, I have to modify the supersymmetry transformation of the gravitinos. And in general, actually, now here we have only one fermion, which is the gravitino, but the general rule is that I have to modify the supersymmetry transformation rules of all fermions in my theory at order g. Okay, here I have only the gravitino, so this is what I see. But in a general supergravity theory, I might have additional fermion fields, and I will have to modify at order g all these transformations. Now, what happens if I do this modification? Well, the consequence now is clear that uh, if you take the variation of the Rarita Schwinger action, now this is generating new terms. Obviously, no. In the Rarita Schwinger, you have the gravitino. Now, this term was cancelled by this variation, as you know, as we checked yesterday. But now I have this additional term. So this is generating now new terms, which have to be cancelled by adding some additional term to my action. And in fact, the second step is to add an order g mass for the fermions. Let me show you this. So if I take the variation at order g now, let me forget about the terms which do not depend on g, because the part that does not depend on g, we already checked. It works. It's supersymmetric, so I don't care about that. I want to see the modification. So uh, if I write down uh, the modification, then you see I have, OK, let me write it down in uh, differential form language. So I have the variation of the gravitino here. I have the variation. I understand now the wedge products. These are differential forms. You know that there are wedge wedges everywhere. Uh, the point is that, of course, I will have plus the emission conjugate. In the action, no, in my kinetic term, I will have a psi, and then I have the derivative on psi. So I have to vary the psi here, and I have to vary the psi under the derivative. Of course, as before, since now I'm, 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 I'm ex making explicit the chiralities, I, will, I can do it for the right-handed ones, and then the left-handed are just the conjugate, so, it, so it's going to work also for that one as well. So if you do that, uh, yeah, let me do it. I'll try to do it f fast enough not to lose too much time. But I mean, the, the, just to follow the, the ideas. So you substitute, uh, you get, uh, of course, you will get the factors of 1 half, a G star, a mass Planck square appearing. And then you will have the field binds and the spinor. So this is going to be the first term. And for what concerns the second term, you will have an analogous expression where now the derivative acts on the transformation. OK, I'm just writing this in differential form language. If I write this in differential form language, I just, you see, if I write this as a differential form, I just remove this. And here, a field bind. OK? There's nothing there. Uh, so the point is that, uh, as usual, uh, since I have now this derivative, I will have uh, the 
Uh, here I have a term with the derivative it's the gravitino. Here I have the derivative acting on the field bind, and then I will have a term where the derivative act on epsilon. Okay. So the uh, thing is that I can integrate by parts the first term as well. So after an integration by parts, I get the following expressions, then you can follow the calculations and check them, but... So, you see, from here, if I do an integration by parts, the derivative is going to hit the field bind. Here I have already the derivative heat in the field bind, so I have two terms where the derivative hits the field bind, and then I have one term where the derivative hits epsilon. And the same is going to be true here, at some point the derivative will hit epsilon. So I have the terms where the derivative hits the field bind, which is something like that. And then I have another term. Yeah, and I don't like the idea of doing there. Sorry, I will continue here. And this term is then of this form, minus i over 2 g star m Planck e a e b psi bar gamma gamma d epsilon. And then, of course, everything plus Hermitian conjugate. Now, the first term, this term, is proportional to the derivative of the field bind. So, I don't care about that. Why I don't care about that? Because if you remember when we wrote this morning at the beginning of the lecture, the supersymmetry transformation of the whole action, the, the, the one without cosmological constant, the term proportional to the derivative of the field bind was the one that entered in the torsion equation. No? I had the differential of the field bind minus psi bar gamma psi, and then this was equal to something. I mean, then and there was a some combination, which I don't care, because either the torsion is vanishing, and so that term takes care of itself, because I am in second order, or it can be taken care by choosing an appropriate transformation rule for the... And this is going to be true here as well, okay? So the, 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 the term, so this is going to modify, either modify the supersymmetry transformation rule of the spin connection if you are in first order formalism, or it's just going to vanish together with other terms that you will get in second order formally, so I don't care about that. I want to focus on this term. This term now tells us right away what I can do in order to cancel it. Because if you stare at it, you have a derivative of the supersymmetry parameter. What is the transformation rule that generates the derivative of the supersymmetry parameter? is a transformation rule of the gravitino. So this means that now if you add a new term, a new term, an L prime, let's say, of order g, which is, you see, i over 4 now, g star e a e b uh, psi bar left, gamma 5, gamma a, b, I'm afraid there was an mp square here as well, no? Yeah, mp square, because I need to have one mass here remaining. Psi left, you see, if I have this term, plus, of course, a conjugate, when I vary this term, I vary, I have two times psi left, and both variations will sum up, and each variation will generate a term from that transformation, which is of this form. So you see, I can cancel this extra term, which comes out of acting with the new order G transformation of the Gravitini on the Rarita-Schwinger action, by introducing 
a mass term, this is a mass term essentially. Now, if you write this in components, this is written down in components, this becomes minus E M Planck G over two psi bar mu right gamma mu nu psi nu right plus Hermitian conjugate. Well, actually, this is the one with G star, so G star left, left. <coughs> okay? And you remember when we wrote down the Rarita Schwinger action with a mass term, this was exactly the mass term psi bar mu, gamma mu nu, psi mu, psi nu. And this is a mass. It's of the order of the Planck mass with a coefficient that is specified by this G. Of course, it's complex, but the phase, I mean, these are fermions, the phase uh, is not important. Okay? So, when you want to introduce a cosmological constant, you modify at order G the supersymmetry transformation rules of the fermions, and if you do that, you're forced to introduce a mass term for the fermions. Okay? Wow, I'm going <laughs> much slower than I thought. But anyway, I hope you can know at least uh, the details. And now, the thing is that once I do that, of course, I have another problem, which is the, this term cancels that if I use this piece of the transformation. Of course, I have also this additional piece in the transformation of the fermion. So this means that when I apply this part of the transformation on the gravitini, I, I generate something of order g square. Okay? So I start from the Rarita Schwinger action, I modify the gravitino with something of order g, I modify then, then I get something from the Rarita Schwinger action at order g, which can be cancelled by adding a mass term, but this is the transformation of the gravitino at order zero. Then I have the transformation of this gravitino at order g. And of course, if I do the transformation there at order g, I get my third modification, an order g square potential, which in this case is just a cosmological constant. In fact, you see, if I do the transformation rule of L prime, and now I do that, and I take the order g part, the zero order gives me a d epsilon, so that's trivial. When I do an order g, I get Well, I have a factor of two, clearly. I get a psi bar mu left, gamma mu nu. And then I have here the transformation psi mu left. So, of course, emission conjugate. And we said that this gives me, a again, uh, Planck mass squared, we said, gamma nu psi right. Okay? Uh, sorry, epsilon right, not psi, epsilon right. That's the transformation rule. So you end up with something that has the following structure, which is very interesting actually. This is, you see, it's minus E, M Planck, uh, I'm missing some M Planck here. Uh, no, that's all right, uh, because then I have the transformation rule. So this is M Planck cube divided by two. Now let's hope I got the factors right. But anyway, the structure for sure is, uh, sorry, minus and minus gives me a plus. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. And and then I get a sidebar mu left, gamma mu nu, gamma mu nu, which gives me a factor of uh, uh, three, I think. And gamma mu. Anyway, it's not the coefficient is not important now. What I'm in, what is important now is structure, because you see, remember that we had, and now I erased it, so once again, not very smart, but anyway, remember that we said that the variation of the field bind was 1 over m Planck epsilon bar gamma a psi mu. So you see this psi bar mu gamma mu epsilon looks like, looks awfully a lot like the variation of the field bind, which is this. And then you have to contract these two terms, these two indices. So you multiply this with the inverse field bind. If you do that, you see I get a 1 over m Planck epsilon bar gamma mu psi mu. And if I want to do the left and right, of course, this is going to be left right plus right left. And of course, using symmetry properties of the gamma matrices, then you swap them with the appropriate sign. The important thing is that essentially, you see, this is like uh, it's related to the variation of the determinant of the field bind. It's the usual. Uh, it's the usual trick, and therefore this term is associated to the simple addition of a new term in your Lagrangian which is simply there's this factor of 3 by Max Planck to the fourth now g to the 4 g square so square. The g square is there, the factor of 3 is there, uh, the factors of 1 half, uh, now probably I'm not sure I gave the right uh, transformation rule for the field bind before, probably I defined it with a 1 half, I'm sorry, let me check it, I should have checked it from the beginning, but the transformation rule of the field bind that I gave at the beginning was with a one half or without? Yeah, it was with a one half, no? Sorry. So the transformation rule was with a one half. This is one half. Okay, anyway, since there is inverse mass Planck, of course, this can be written no, with a, a m Planck to the four, and then you put down here the inverse Planck mass, okay? So the, the crucial thing though is that this is the Lagrangian that you have to add. And this is precisely the addition of a negative cosmological constant and precisely of the form that we expected. Uh, sorry, I'm going back to find the correct coefficient. Here it is. So this is, well, this is what you want to interpret as m Planck square integral in d for x e lambda. And this means that your lambda is minus 3 m Planck square g square. And it's negative, of course. OK? So uh, and it's related to the uh, radius of the anti -de sitter space. So also in this case, the construction is such that you do not have the freedom of the choice of the sign. Supersymmetry closes only for one specific sign of the cosmological constant, which is OK, because that's the algebra we started from. But you see the realization here. 
The important message here, though, which is more general than what we have been doing, is that when we will start introducing interactions and we are interested in gaugings in particular, or in gaugings of extended supergravities, or even of simple supergravity, or whenever you couple matter in n equals one supergravity, you will see that you can improve this constant g to a full function, a full holomorphic function of the scalar fields, then when you modify the supersymmetry transformation rules of the fermions, then you will have to add an order g mass term for the fermion. Of course, it's a Lagrangian mass. Then the actual value will depend on the expectation value of the scalars. And then you will have a scalar potential. And the nice thing is that now, you see, since this is the last term, and the variation is the standard variation of the I don't generate anything at order g, g cube. I'm done. My Lagrangian is supersymmetric. Nothing, in principle, could have told me from the beginning that I should have stopped at order g square. This thing could have gone on forever, no? I add something of order g, I modify the Lagrangian, of course, then when I act on that, I get something of order g square. Then when I act on the term of order g square, I get something of order g cube, and so on and so forth. Whereas here, everything stops at order g square. Why is that? Because we modified only the fermions and not the bosons. So clearly, I start from the Lagrangian, I modify the fermions at order g, I generate a term of order g, which is a term in the fermions, but then at the next time, I generate something of order g squared, which is cancelled by the transformation rules of the bosons, which have not been modified, so I don't need to add additional stuff. I don't need to go to order g cubed, g, g quad, g to the fourth, and so on and so forth. So it's a very interesting and and uh, and uh, an important fact. So you have a shift in the Fermi supersymmetry rules, a mass for the fermions, and the potential. And the other important thing, which is also going to be true in general, and it's related to a so-called supersymmetric world identity, is the fact that the potential that we get, so this additional term that we have generated here, comes out from the square of the shifts of the Fermi transformation rules. So you see, I have shifted the supersymmetry transformation rules with G, and I will get a potential which is just G squared. You will see later on when we couple matter, if in the gravitino I will have terms that depend on the superpotential, this means I will get something here that depends on the superpotential square. In the Gagini, I will have the D term. This means in the potential, we'll get the D term squared. I have the Chiralini, which have the derivatives of the superpotential. I will get the derivatives of the superpotential square. So each fermion has some term that will contribute to the scalar potential. So the scalar potential can be actually written down as the sum of the squares of the shifts of the fermions. So you already know from global supersymmetry you know, that the, the, the fermions of the chiral multiplets can have a term which is proportional to the derivative of the superpotential. The auxiliary field F, essentially, you know, is what becomes the derivative of the superpotential. You'll get the derivative of the superpotential square. The gauge Heaney will have a D term. You will get the D term square. The gravitini have the superpotential naked, as we will show. I will show you later. You will have a negative contribution proportional to the superpotential square. Okay? Now, before I go on, questions? Okay, this was mainly a derivation, of course, of the supersymmetry of the action, but I, I stress and I insist a lot the three steps, because this is what is going to happen in any supergravity theory. Okay, this is here, everything is very simple. It's just a constant. This is going to happen in general for any, uh, any supergravity theory. Okay. 
Now, this I did. Okay, very good. So now that we know what is the form of supergravity and supergravity with a cosmological constant, I will introduce what well, we're going to discuss then in detail next Monday. Which are matter couplings. Okay. So we'll just do the introduction now, and then on Monday we will discuss it more in detail. And if you're interested in something more about the mass in ADS, I would say we can use one of the discussion sessions next week. Okay so that I don't interrupt the flow of the lectures. Okay, so first of all, in global supersymmetry, you can have several different matter multiplets. But essentially, what you use mostly are chiral multiplets and vector multiplets. Chiral multiplets for matter and vector multiplets for the interactions, the gauge interactions. Okay? So let me assume for the time being that we are interested in the coupling of supergravity to chiral multiplets and vector multiplets. There are additional multiplets that you could use, linear multiplets, uh, depending on the number of supersymmetries, you will have additional multiplets with tensor fields generically, but uh, I mean, in four dimensions, a tensor field is always dual either to a scalar if it is massless or to a vector if it is massive. So, I mean, uh, of course, there are complications also there, uh, especially if you want to go beyond the classical level. But let me assume that we are using only chiral and vector multiplet interactions. A global supersymmetric theory what are the ingredients that I need to give in order to justify a global supersymmetric theory? How many chiral multiplets and how many vector multiplets I have, obviously. What are the ingredients that I need to specify to fix the Lagrangian, a supersymmetric Lagrangian, global supersymmetric Lagrangian? I'm asking you. We have 10 minutes. Let's introduce some interaction. <laughs> Let's start with the ones at a time. So the Kähler potential. The Kähler potential K is a function, a real function of my of the scale, the chiral multiplet, and it specifies the set interactions of the chiral multiplet. From the Kähler potential, you know that if the derivatives you derive the metric that fixes the kinetic terms. Now, if you look at the kinetic terms of the chiral, here you will have something like that, and then the same metric is going to be, uh, yeah, okay, let me write it like this. The same is going to be true for the fermions, yeah, okay, 
Okay, so this is going to be the kinetic term, and since this is going to depend now, this metric here is going to depend on phi and phi bar, because it comes from the second derivatives of the scalar potential, this gives you a sigma model for the scalar fields, and it gives you interactions of the scalar fields to the fermions, so this introduces self-interactions for the chiral multiplets. Okay, so self-interactions of the chiral multiplets are specified by the killer potential, Another important ingredient is, of course, the superpotential. Now, K is a real function. The superpotential, instead, is a holomorphic function, which means that W depends only on phi, not on phi bar. And you know that, for instance, uh, the mass term The mass term for the fermions is going to come from the second derivative of the superpotential. And you also know that the potential will contain the first derivatives of the superpotential. Okay? I might miss a factor of two there, but I mean one half, whatever, it's not important. It's the structure right now that it's interesting, okay? So the thing is uh, that, of course, the superpotential introduces interactions for the scalars, no? It gives you a potential, a scalar potential. This is how you break supersymmetry eventually, no? If you have that, uh, the derivatives of the superpotential on the vacuum in a certain direction are non-vanishing, then you break supersymmetry. And you might generate, uh, uh, mass terms for, and of course, if you break supersymmetry, you can generate masses no, for the fields, in particular for the fermions, for the scalars, the masses come from the potential, obviously. Okay? So this is still global supersymmetry. Is that all? If I have vector multiplets, what can I do with them? I just write the free action for the vector multiplets. If I want to introduce interactions, what kind of interactions can I introduce? I can introduce a gauge group, no? I so one ingredient is going to be the gauge group. And of course, not just the gauge group, but the gauge group and its action on the fields. Now, I might have fields that are charged under the gauge group, and I might have fields which are not charged. So I have my vector multiplets. I want to use my vector multiplets as multiplets which contain the gauge bosons of my gauge group. Now, if I want to have a local gauge symmetry, then I better have some global gauge symmetry at the beginning, no, that I want to make local. So I might have that some of the symmetries of the isometries of this space. No, this is a, I mean, this object gij bar can be interpreted as the metric on the, uh, uh, on the space of chiral fields. No, you have your, you can interpret your, uh, uh, fields phi i as coordinates. So you interpret these as coordinates on a space, which is the space that is parameterized by the chiral fields. And this gij bar is going to be the metric on this manifold. Okay? So now, once you have this, this space, this is a, a Euclidean, of course, space, because you don't want to get, you want always here to have the same sign, no? You don't want to have the wrong sign of the kinetic terms. So clearly this must be Euclidean. Uh, then you have, you describe the self-interaction. That space might have symmetries, might have isometries. And 
these isometries can be made local, so you can introduce a gauge group where some of these gauge symmetries are nothing but the isometry of the space. And this means that some of these scalar fields essentially are charged under the gauge group, under the action of the gauge group. Okay, so I'll, I'll give a brief example now. But So what you have to specify here, the action on the fields is essentially which isometries of the scalar manifold, so let me call psi lambda i, these are holomorphic, of course if they are isometries, these are killing vectors on M chiral. And you want to know which isometries you want to make local. Okay, you want to make, uh, you want to interpret as gauge symmetry. So you want to know which of your scalar fields are charged. For instance, very simple example. Let's take a chiral, a killer potential that is trivial. Take the killer potential which is phi, phi bar. Okay, well, let's take n of these. So i, j bar, delta i, j bar. Then clearly here I have uh, a metric g i, j bar, which is simply delta i, j bar. It's the second mixed derivative. So this essentially is telling me that my space, the space of chiral bullets, is nothing but Cn. Okay? With the flat metric. I have just a delta there. I don't have, I'm not doing anything. No? So this is a trivial emission metric on a complex n dimension, nc dimensional space. So what are the isometries? Well, clearly you have translations and you have uh, rotations. So, you see, uh, the fact that, for instance, uh, uh, you could take one of these, let's take one of these, and rotate it with a phase, this leaves, obviously, the Keller potential invariant and therefore leaves the metric invariant. This is going to be generated by, this is an isometry which has a killing vector field. My vector, my killing, Killing psi is simply a constant i. No, there is nothing here. I mean, delta phi is i phi. Alpha, if I introduce the parameter, alpha is my parameter here. So, okay, this is with parameter alpha. So the killing vector is just i. Uh, and uh, uh, and then. The, the uh, uh, sorry, I phi, if I write the killing vector, I should write here I phi. It's the rotation anyway. And the thing is that uh, this is simply telling me that now, this, if I want to gauge this, if I want to make this now local, I want to introduce a parameter here that depends on space-time. So I want to make this global symmetry local. Then this means that I am saying that the field phi now is charged under the gauge group. So specifying the, uh, specifying the killings gives essentially the charges fields under the gauge group. It's a bit more complicated. In this case it's almost trivial, no? Because you're simply saying the there is a rotation with a certain phase, and so it's the usual stuff. But of course, if the metry becomes a bit more complicated, then of course everything is going to be more complicated. Okay? But we'll come to this because this is something that usually is not discussed very much also in global supersymmetry, and I think it's a very important point. So we'll discuss it even in global supersymmetry before going. Well, I'll just do the discussion directly in supergravity, but you will see most of the things apply directly in. Uh, global supersymmetry. We're not yet done though. There is still another thing you can do in global supersymmetry before concluding. What else can I do? I can introduce a Faheliopoulos term indeed.
I could have a number of them. You know, you, you can introduce Phi Heliopoulos for U1 factors in your gauge group, and this will help in breaking supersymmetry. And once you have all these ingredients, so you specify the number of chiral multiplet and vector multiplet, you specify the killer potential, you specify the superpotential. Ah, yes, no, I'm still forgetting one thing, actually. Uh, you also have, if you give up renormalizability, of course, you also have to specify the gauge kinetic functions. These are also holomorphic functions, no? but uh, they are matrices that tell you the interaction between the scalar and the vectors. Imagine that you have a number of vector fields. No, let's write down the, the free Lagrangian. The free Lagrangian, well, here we'll have a certain coupling constant, and this will be f mu nu i f mu nu j with a delta i j here, clearly. No, this is if you have n vector fields, let's say. Now, if you give up renormalizability, of course, and I'm discussing now the most general theory, so I'm not discussing renormalizable models. Uh, in fact, I said a superpotential, which is a generic holomorphic function. I didn't say a cubic superpotential. It can be also not renormalizable. Then I can promote what I have here, this coupling. So if you s actually, essentially, I can interpret this coupling constants. Well, actually, here in principle, I could have uh, different coupling constant for each group factor. But let's say I could, I could improve this to a matrix. I could improve this to a matrix, uh, and generically I will have, since this has to be real, will be the real part of this holomorphic function here, which may depend on the scalar fields. Okay, this also gives no minimal couplings between the vectors and the scalars, and this also can appear in your, uh, in your generic uh, global supersymmetric theory. So, chiral multiplets, number of chirals, numbers of vectors, scalar potential, superpotential, gauge kinetic function, the isometries, which tell me what is the gauge group and eventually what is the D term, because of course this gives you the D terms, and the Phi Heliopoulos. These are all the ingredients that are necessary to specify a global supersymmetric theory. What is going to happen in supergravity, which we'll see Monday, is that the ingredients are the same, but, and but are important here, what we have is that scalar potential and superpotential, which in global supersymmetry are two independent ingredients, in supergravity, they are not independent. So in supergravity, they're not independent ingredients anymore. In supersymmetry, you specify the killer potential, you specify the potential. In supergravity, you will either have a superpotential or not, but once you do that, you have essentially just one thing to specify. Now, for convenience, you might still keep them separated, but they talk to each other. The other thing is that the Phi Heliopoulos terms are not arbitrary anymore. But actually, they're going to be related to the uh, non-gauge invariance of the superpotential. So you will have Phi Heliopoulos terms only when you have, uh, well, you can write down the Phi Heliopoulos terms, as you will see, as the derivative of the superpotential along the killing vectors of the isometries that you uh, have taken here in order to gauge uh, a certain group. So, these structures are going to change. Moreover, in global supersymmetry 
the killer potential will give you so-called killer manifolds. In supergravity, you will have an additional condition, which is not too constraining, but still, it is there, which tells you that the scalar manifold are not going to be just scalar, but they are going to be so-called Hodge scalar manifold. So this means that they are going to be scalar, but of restricted type. So not any supersymmetric theory that has a certain scalar manifold can be embedded in a supergravity theory with the same scalar potential. Certain killer potentials you can use for both supergravity and supersymmetry. Other killer potentials you cannot. So there are restrictions. So this tells you that when you go from supersymmetry to supergravity, things are going to change. And what I'm going to show you next week is precisely what is going to change. So these things here, on top of the fact that you will have lots of new terms appearing in your Lagrangian, which are going to be, of course, Planck mass suppressed, because in the limit where the Planck mass goes to infinity, you should recover, possibly, a super global supersymmetric theory. You will have, as I already mentioned, the fact that the superpotential will appear naked, so without derivatives, which is something that doesn't appear in supersymmetry. You will have the killer potential appearing naked, which is also something which doesn't happen in supersymmetry, and which is the origin of the fact that the killer manifolds are going to be constrained. Okay. So, if there are questions, otherwise, I think we can stop here. I, hi, yep. uh, I have one question. So this, is, uh, this is just due to curiosity. So, here we are working mainly the homogeneous manifolds. So Dissitor and anti dissitor uh, they have the isometries. So can we, can, am I not audible? Can you, can you repeat, sorry, I, I lost you completely. Yeah, so uh, here we are dealing mainly with the homogeneous manifold. So, so you want a, a, a scalar manifold which is homogeneous now, scalar potential which gives a homogeneous manifold, that's the point. Yes, Do I understand? In the okay. In the dissitor and the anti dissitor both are homogeneous, right? Ah, no, now you're talking about the sitter and anti sitter. Okay, Do both yeah, are homogeneous, yeah. yes. Yeah, but my, my question is, uh, so can we supersymmetrize or do any supergravity analysis for a non-homogeneous manifold? Can we do... Uh, you, yes, you can. Well, uh, uh, so, yes, yes. The answer is yes. So, the thing is... Uh, what I was trying to do there was to construct the... Uh, supersymmetry algebra for anti de sitter and for the sitter, and I showed you that you cannot do it for the sitter. Uh, what you can have, and so this means that indeed you can have uh, a supersymmetric theory living on uh, anti de sitter uh, and anti de sitter space time. In general, you can uh, check that you, ca you can. Uh, uh, put your supergravity theory on a background, so uh, and you can have backgrounds which are supersymmetric, which are given in terms of homogeneous manifolds. Uh, so I, I don't know. I mean, when you when you do, for instance, uh, string theory, I mean, ten-dimensional supergravity, uh, in order, for instance, to go down from ten to uh, five dimensions or four dimensions, let's go from 11 to four, for instance, uh, then you can take uh, M theory, for instance, on S7, which is a quotient, it's a sphere, so it's a quotient, again, it's a homogeneous manifold, and then you have that the background ADS4 times S7 is the product of two homogeneous manifolds, and it's a good background, again, for, for supergravity. And you can generalize this. Yeah, I think the question was also about non-homogeneous manifolds, if I got it uh, right. Well, you can have backgrounds which are supersymmetric and which are not homogeneous manifolds. We'll discuss black hole solutions, for instance. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? So sorry if I took 10 minutes, but I gave you five minutes the first lecture, so. <laughs>
Well, okay, if there are no other questions, we can uh, okay. stop here for I'll today. I'll see you on Monday then. There is lunch, and then we...